I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York. A horrifying 911 emergency. Sit down, baby, sit down. Yeah, send the ambulance now. A successful single mother of two badly burned. It's a, uh, I think it's a uh, drain cleaner, and, and, uh, and we slipped. He just kept saying it was an accident. But this is no accident. It was a horrible, horrific scene. What kind of monster would do this? Today, after 13 painful surgeries and unbelievable bravery, this survivor is ready to show her face. My last image is of him standing behind me, just watching me suffer. Plus, he did everything he could to hurt me. She was victimized by the man she called daddy. I was beat, I was tortured, I was raped. And she says her own mother looked the other way. Now they're about to come face to face. We're done. We're done. We are done. Right now. Andrea Isom, sir, with Crime Watch yeah. Daily. Jason Mattel with Crime Watch Daily. This. I'm Elizabeth. I'm here with Crime Watch. I'm Michelle from Crime Watch Daily. Anna Garcia from Crime Watch. Is Crime Watch oh, Daily. Stay off my property. We'll find you again. We always do. Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. We start today with one of the worst cases of domestic violence we've ever seen and the brave survivor who wouldn't stop until her attacker was brought to justice. Melissa McCarty is in Georgia with our top story. And we want to warn you, some of the images in this story are hard to watch. A beautiful single mother of two doused by industrial strength drain cleaner. It's burning her skin. Okay, it's burning her skin. Yeah. But was it just a tragic household accident? He, kept, he kept, just kept saying it was an accident. Or a malicious act too heinous and evil to comprehend? It was a horrible, horrific scene. At that point, the acid had burned my eyelids closed, so I couldn't open my eyes anymore. She was actually unrecognizable. After 13 agonizing reconstructive surgeries, Christy Sims opens up to Crime Watch Daily to tell her horrifying story of pain, loss, and recovery. I lived in isolation for a whole year. That had nothing to do with vanity. It's social responsibility. I was horrible looking. Christy Sims and Andrew Fordham had a tumultuous relationship, one her mother, Elaine, feared was doomed from the start. When I first minute I saw him, I looked at him, and I said, no, this is not the man for my baby. I didn't like his demeanor. I didn't like the way he carried himself. He just didn't look like the man that would be for my daughter. And you were on and off for several years, and you were drawn to him because he was charming. Very charming, very romantic. Did he ever express any type of violence, verbally or physically? He had a very aggressive personality. He was emotionally abusive um, at times when I, in retrospect, I didn't realize I was in that situation when I, when I was in it. And we broke up for a long time and he begged me to come back and I went back. It was a cycle of abuse, I was in it. I can admit it now, I'm woman enough to admit that I was in that situation. A successful substance abuse counselor and raising two children on her own, Christy had just completed coursework to receive her master's degree. I was 42 years old, but I went back to get a graduate degree. I had been, I finished in two years, and I'm the first woman in my family to go to college. So, you know, I didn't want to walk, because you know, all these young kids, they're walking, and I'm 42 years old, getting, you know, going back to school. But my mom was like, no, you're gonna walk. Like, this is huge. We're gonna have a party. We're gonna have a graduation. She also felt it was time to move on from Andrew. She was beginning to see him as being a little too possessive and a little, you know, over the top. She did tell me that she was contemplating on leaving him, and I did say, well, Christy, just be careful. You know, you can't just break relationships off just like that. Be very, very, very careful, you know. She was confident, not thinking that anything would happen, but I still had this good feeling, you know, and I had this prayer in my heart for my child. Christy says she made up her mind to end the relationship in April of 2013. That was the last weekend I knew in my heart that we were going to be together. And so there was this resolve that I had that I was finally ending that relationship and that I was going to be moving forward. And so I had a lot of peace about it. And I think he could feel that, you know, this is my last weekend with her. 
That Sunday afternoon, while hanging out at Christie's home near Atlanta, Andrew called to her from the bathroom. He says, babe, you know, I've wasted a little water on the floor. Bring me a towel. And I said, okay, I grabbed the towel, and I just start walking down the hallway. So when I'm walking down the hallway and I see him literally standing there, only wearing boxers, no shoes, no gloves, no shirt, nothing, and he's holding a yellow bowl from my kitchen, which made no sense to me. So I never even went into the bathroom. I stopped um, right outside the bathroom. I was just holding a towel. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, why do you have a bowl in the bathroom? He's slipping and sliding, holding the bowl with two hands. My assumption was that it was water. Now, even in that moment, I still don't feel danger. Like, I knew something was wrong, but I still didn't know that what's in that bowl is gonna change your life forever. So I just stand there and I'm just holding the towel. Before I could even move, he had taken the bowl with two hands and doused it directly upward into my face and into my eyes. What Christy doesn't know is that inside the bowl is not water, but an industrial grade cleaner containing 93% pure sulfuric acid. As seen in this YouTube demonstration, the acid is a powerful corrosive, and one can easily imagine what it does to human flesh and bone. The first thing that started to burn, I didn't feel anything burning, but my eyeballs, my eyes started to burn. And so the, and he's just standing behind me. The, my last image of, is of him standing behind me, just watching me, watching me suffer. Is he saying anything? Mm -mm, nothing, he's just standing, but he never said anything, even from the point, point that I came down that hallway, he never said a word, he just looked at me. And then everything started to burn. Then I said, call 911. He kept standing there, call 911. Henry County 911, what's up? Yes, I need an ambulance. What's going on? My, my girlfriend, we just, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a uh, drain cleaner. We're just putting it in the, uh, in the toilet and, and, the, and we slip. Sit down, baby, sit down. Oh, oh. She fell. Sit down, sit. She fell. Oh. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, send the ambulance now. Okay. It's burning her skin. Okay, it's burning her skin. Yes. Okay. She fell on his brain now. Yes. Okay, just one second. I'm going to get poison control on the line, too, okay? Yes. Um, we, have, we have a 43 year old female that has slipped and fell on Drano, and her skin is burning. We need to wash it off real good with salt and water. Um, after that, if she's still experiencing burning, she may need to be evaluated in our emergency room. Yes, sir, are you guys washing it off with soap and water? Yes, I just... Okay, you're washing it with soap and water. Is she still... Is it still burning? Yes, it's burning. Me too. It's on me. It's, uh... How's her breathing? Uh, how's your breathing? She, she's, she's breathing fine. Studio. Look. Andrew. Yes. Okay, did she get in her eyes as well? Uh, is, is it in your eyes? Yes. She said yes. yes. Okay, she, it sounds like she needs to get in the shower. She needs to get this stuff off okay, of her. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. I'm, I don't know. It sounds like more than Jaina. It, it sounds like more than a slip and fall, too. Oh my goodness. Paramedics arrive, but the worst for Christy Sims is yet to come. Up next, this brave woman now steps out from behind the mask to show her face on Crime Watch Daily. We return now with more of the powerful story of Christy Sims. For that, let's head back to Georgia and our Melissa McCarty. And we want to warn you, some of the images in this story are hard to watch. Are these the results of a terrible accident or abject evil? Christy Sims, an attractive single mother of two, has just been doused with a bowl of blistering sulfuric acid, a so-called accident by her boyfriend, Andrew Fordham. Her agonizing screams captured on his call to 911. She's screaming, please send somebody else. Is she bleeding from anywhere? Burning her skin. Okay, it's burning her skin. Yes. Yeah. Paramedics arrive to find her blinded, her flesh being eaten away by the corrosive drain cleaner. Now, after 13 surgeries, this brave woman comes out from behind the mask to share her story of terror, agony, and incredible courage. At that moment that the paramedics arrived, it was the most torrential rainfall in all of 2013. And it was the rainfall that they used to rinse me off. You're kidding.
I was closer to the door. I was too far away from anything else. And so they, they, they took me outside, stripped me down, took all of my clothes off. It was the rainwater that saved my life because the acid came within two centimeters of my heart. To spare her from unimaginable pain, Christy is placed in a medically induced coma for two whole months. So I woke up blind, unable to walk, unable to move my arms because the acid affected the nerves in my arms. So I had to have intense occupation on physical therapy for months before I could even walk or use my arms, bathe myself, and slowly over time, my eyesight did come back. At first, police are led to believe Fordham's account of what happened, that he spilled the drain cleaner by accident. When you were opening your eyes and coming to terms with what happened, he wasn't in jail. No. How come? He said it was an accident. And when they questioned me, within one hour of having my body burned to the third and fourth degree, 20% of my body, they questioned me. And they said that I said it was an accident. I have no memory of ever being questioned. I was in shock. But prosecutor Sandy Rivers is convinced this was no accident. There were two EMTs that responded to the house when it happened. And they are the ones that contacted the police and said, this is not an accident. Y'all need to investigate this. Rivers begins by taking another listen to the 911 call and the instructions from Poison Control. Is she washing it off right now? I have poison control on the line. We need to wash it off real good with soap and water. Are you guys washing it off with soap and water? Yes. Okay, is it still burning? Yes, it's burning me too, it's on me. To me, the smoking gun was when I heard the 911 call, the dispatcher telling him to put water on her because, you know, if this water had been put on her quickly, immediately, it would have negated the injuries. And listen closely to this snippet of Christy in the background, just as paramedics arrive. Why is this so damning? Because Fordham never even attempted to wash off the acid. He said to her, just sit there, just sit there. She's begging for help. Right. And he's saying, just sit there. Just sit there. That's what she told me. When he put the phone down and came back to me, I said, what did they say? Why is it burning so bad? What is this? He said, babe, they said, if, you put, if I put water in, it's going to ignite the chemical. So just sit here until the ambulance gets here. And I sat there for about 13 minutes, and it just burned through my skin. What do you make of him? Cold, calculated? Evil. If you've spent a lot of time looking at domestic violence cases, there is the classic phenomena of, if I can't have you, nobody else will. And I think that he wanted to make her unattractive to anybody but Disfigured. him. Disfigured. Mm-hmm. Sandy Rivers is determined to prosecute Andrew Fordham, but she'll need Christie's help to do it. When Christy first came into my office, she had on a veil, which covered everything except for her eyes and nose. You wanted to think that was a little dramatic, but when she took it off, it was a horrible, horrific scene. But Christy shows incredible courage, revealing to the entire world the horror inflicted upon her by the man who claimed he loved her. He could have rinsed me off, and just him rinsing me off, I would have been burned, probably to the second degree, but I would not have had to have my entire face replaced. I would have some resemblance of who I used to be, and I don't have that anymore. Christy summons the strength to face Fordham in court, testifying to his unspeakable cruelty. That's the part that it's hard to forgive, because even after he doused me, he let me sit and burn, and he saw how much pain I was in. See, nobody else saw how much pain I was in, but he did. He saw it. And that 911 tape is ultimately what helped put him away? Yes, because it contradicted everything that he said. Despite his claims of innocence to the bitter end, Andrew Fordham is found guilty and sentenced to 20 years behind bars. In the meantime, Christy Sims has endured more than a dozen painful reconstructive surgeries. I had a social responsibility. You don't go out in public looking the way I was looking. My own daughter was afraid of me, so children could not even be around me. But now, Christy has found the strength to turn her tragic story into a shining example of hope, faith, and courage, penning a book called Yellow Tulips on a Cloudy Day. She's funny, she's fun, and she's not 
been victimized by this. I mean, she's stronger because of this. It has changed her life, but I don't think it'll define her life. And through her Christy Sims Foundation, she hopes to reach potential victims of domestic violence before it's too late. I travel, I go into middle schools and high schools, I tell my story, and I give all the warning signs. And instead of focusing on helping people after the fact, I try to prevent it. Christy is still shining. She's still shining. She's still courageous. I'm so proud of her about the fact that she's stepping out, speaking to people and crowds and all over the world, you know, and she's not ever going to give up. She's going to always press for it because that's who Christy is. No matter how bad stuff is, like even being grateful for this little dumper right here, you just find a way to be grateful and that's how you survive. You find something, something positive in the negative. Coming up, she was just a child when her adoptive father did the unthinkable. How often were you abused? On a daily, whenever he felt like it. Raped, tortured, even forced to have a baby with him. As Chloe fights to keep the monster in jail, he breaks his silence to Crime Watch Daily from behind bars. That's next. All right, now to the story of Chloe Howie, a young girl who faced the ultimate betrayal from her adoptive father. Michelle Sagona has more on Chloe's mission to fight back. This monster's name is Michael Hines, and he systematically tortured, raped, and impregnated a little girl, his own daughter. The depraved child predator has spent the last 10 years in prison, where Crime Watch Daily tried to contact him numerous times for an interview. And now, for the first time, he's responded. She was born Christina Green. That's the only picture I have of me of when I was a baby. A beautiful young child full of promise and potential. But the girl named Christina is no more. What happened to that girl? The look on his face. Is the kind of evil. And I knew I was in trouble. No one wants to believe really exist. I was beat, I was tortured. I was raped. Today, the girl once known as Christina goes by Chloe, bearing only a passing resemblance to her former self. And you have a son yourself. I do. Um, I have a four-year-old, and he is the second child that I've had in my lifetime. The first, a baby boy she had when she was just 13. I never had that motherly bond with him. Even though he grew inside of me, I never had that connection, you know, with him. The reason for that has everything to do with who the father is. The same man, Chloe, called dad. Talk to me about who Michael Hines is. Michael Hines legally adopted me through the state of Kansas. I was placed in and out of foster care for quite a while until he fought against the state to get legal rights to me. He was the biological father of Chloe's two half-siblings, Jessica and Mikey Jr., but he was also a convicted felon. And what was in his criminal background? All kinds of things, you know, possession, uh, guns, felonies, burglaries. And the state allowed him to have children? Yeah. Then again, Michael wasn't going it alone. He had recently married a woman named Patricia, and together they put on the appearance of a loving family. Do you remember moving into their home? I do. I remember waking up the next morning and I had wetted myself, my bed, and I knew it was because I didn't want to be there. Right away, I was constantly being told to clean the house, do the chores, you know, whatever they needed, I was supposed to do it. Like some real life Cinderella, but this was no fairy tale and things were not headed toward a happy ending. A warning, this next part may be difficult to hear. The first time it happened, I know I was asleep and he just came into my room and he got on top of me and he just shoved my face in the pillow and told me that if I didn't want it to keep happening, then I had to be good. And how often were you abused? On a daily, whenever he felt like it. And it went on like that for years with no one to turn to and sworn to secrecy by her abuser. Chloe carried her pain in silence, but there are some secrets that can't be concealed. 
When Chloe was about 13, she came to school with a bruised face. So your friend saw you with a black eye. She just kind of said, okay, get up, we're going to the counselor. And then when I did, I do remember crying and breaking down to him and telling him everything that was going on in my home. And he said that he would send a counselor out to my house and I begged him not to. When the school day ended, Chloe walked outside, expecting her so-called parents to be waiting, but they weren't there. When I was walking home from school, I thought to myself, either one, I'm in big trouble because I opened my mouth to the counselor, or two, he's actually in jail, finally, for what he did to me. It was a fantasy almost too exciting to indulge, and sadly, one too good to be true. Though a social worker was sent to the house, according to Chloe, Michael and Patricia were able to convince the worker that she was just a troubled teen spreading lies. Michael remained free. When I walked around the corner and I saw him shoveling the driveway, I knew I was in big trouble. To tell us what happened next, Chloe takes us back to the house where it all went down. He was right here shoveling the driveway. And, and I just, I, I was right over here and I just took off running as quick as I could, but he just dropped the shovel and he ran and he chased me inside and I was crying and I went into the bathroom to grab a tissue and he grabbed me by the back of my hair and he told me that, that I was gonna learn my lesson and he slammed my face into the mirror. Tragically, it was only the beginning. He did everything he could to hurt me but he thought maybe I wouldn't say anything anymore. For the next three days, Michael keeps Chloe home from school, abusing the girl relentlessly. And during every second of her terror, unbeknownst to anyone, Chloe had another life growing inside of her. I was already pregnant at that point. And you were how old? I was only 13. Did Patricia know at that time that this was Mike's child? I'm sure. There was never no question from her who the father was. We tried to track down Patricia for comment, but we weren't able to find her, at least not yet. So you fulfill the pregnancy? Forcefully. What did you name the baby? I didn't name the baby. They named the baby. They named him Tyler. After that, the entire family moved down the street to a bigger home. But as Chloe grew older, she also grew more defiant. One night, I chose not to come home from school. And I took the baby and I tried to run away to a friend's house. And he knew exactly where I was. So he showed up, he had his gun on him. Fearing for her friend's safety, Chloe grabs Tyler and gets in Michael's truck. He was drunk, he was so drunk. And I remember him swerving all over the road and he, reached up and he punched the sunroof out and glass just went everywhere and I remember covering the baby's face up because I had him in my arms. As soon as Michael pulled into the driveway, Chloe bolted, barricading herself in her room with Tyler. But the 200 plus pound man forced his way in. He was just in my face screaming and going off and I kicked him and when I did the gun went off. My head happened to be right there and I just you know, it went past me and it scared me. I remember the ringing to this day of the shotgun going off and I just took off running. Straight for the phone. When he saw I was already on the phone with the dispatch, he looked at me and he said, you're dead. Luckily for Chloe, there wouldn't be time to carry out his threat. <laughs> Though he ran, authorities caught up to him the next day and finally, Michael Hines Sr., the man responsible for the systematic rape and abuse of his own adopted daughter, was under arrest. Because of state law at the time, prosecutors were also able to lump some of Michael's previous convictions into his sentencing, and he was given 48 years in three months. As for Chloe, she's changed her name, got adopted by a family friend, Belinda Howie, and maybe for the first time in her entire life, finally felt safe. Then, just one week before this interview, everything changed. On Thursday night, I received a text message from Belinda and she was just hysterical and she was crying. What she found out next would open up some of the deepest wounds. Had I known 10 years ago that this was gonna happen and I was gonna have to go through all this again, I wish he would've took my life that night. I, I honestly do. Coming up, 
A change in the law gives Michael Hines a new day in court. And you think he's going to be surprised to see you there tomorrow? For the first time in 10 years, Chloe faces her abuser. Honestly, I, I hope he poops his pants. <laughs> We're back now with more of the story of Chloe Howie, a young girl sexually assaulted by her adoptive father. What she went through is enough trauma for any one lifetime, but Chloe is now being forced to confront that monster one more time. Here's Michelle Sagoda. Like a lot of young girls, Chloe Howie kept a diary in which she wrote her most private thoughts. But instead of pages filled with teenage crushes and bad poetry, Chloe's diary documented years of rape and torture at the hands of her own adoptive father. There was just one night where I had left it open and I could hear him coming. I shoved it under my pillow and he climbed on top of me. And at some point, he felt the journal under my pillow. He instantly took it outside and put it on his grill and he lit it on fire. Then, when Chloe was 16, Michael Hines Sr. was finally arrested after coming at her with a gun. For that and unrelated crimes, including an old burglary charge, he was sentenced to 48 years behind bars. But now, almost 10 years into his sentence, because of a change in Kansas state law, Michael Hines has a new day in court. Because of the law that had passed, he will be entirely resentenced. So this really could drop drastically his years? Yes. You think he's going to be surprised to see you there tomorrow? I hope he poops his pants <laughs> because that's what he deserves. I want him to think, crap, I didn't want her to show up, you know? Because I, I know that he knows I can have an influence on his resentencing. The next day, the day of reckoning. Though our cameras won't be allowed in the courtroom, Chloe shares with us some of the words she plans to read in front of her abuser. I am here to ensure that no one forgets the evil that you are, the evil which is not minimized because only one crime was taken off your record, the evil that will follow me for the rest of my life, and the evil that will follow the child conceived through this monster. That evil is you. You were supposed to be my father, not my rapist. You were supposed to be my father, not the father of my child. You are here today because you think you have beat the state of Kansas like you used to beat me when I was a child. And I'm here today to tell you that you are dead wrong. You have not won, you never will, and hell has a very special place for you. I don't want people to get the wrong signal when I'm reading this later because I am very emotional, but I'm hiding it because I just, I just want him to hear me. At the courthouse, I give Chloe a few final words of encouragement, and then it's time to head in. Good luck. Inside, the same judge from the first trial listened to Chloe's words, then looked right at Michael, and breaking with his usual protocol, began to lecture the man. The judge told Michael Hines his crimes are inexcusable and he violated Chloe's trust as a parent. He gave Michael Hines the opportunity to address the court, to address Chloe, but instead Michael Hines chose to say nothing. Bound by the law, the judge was forced to overturn Michael's previous burglary conviction, cutting his total sentence in half. With time served, that leaves him with just 14 more years behind bars. Is Mr. Hines remorseful? He has expressed some remorse to me. He's... He has expressed remorse? Yeah, he, he's very... doesn't even know why he did what he did. However, you know, I, I didn't think it was in his best interest, and he didn't think it was in his best interest to speak today, so he didn't. Tell me your reaction to the verdict. The judge did make what he could a fair ruling. While Chloe goes to gather her thoughts, I catch up with one of her staunchest supporters, Belinda Howie, the woman who adopted her after Michael's arrest and is now raising her son. You were crying in the courtroom. I could hear your sobs. You were sitting right behind me. For me, it takes me back to when they were little and all the pain and all the hurt that they felt. Standing by Belinda's side was another one of her adopted daughters, a young girl named Novea. But like Chloe, she used to have a different name. You are Michael Hines' biological daughter. Yes. 
Were but, you one of his victims? Yes. For how long? It started, I think we were 11, 12. We were young. Was he ever charged with any of the crimes he did to you? No. Why is that? Because I couldn't stand up and testify. Has stand a statute up. of limitations run out? No, I don't think so. We promise Nevaeh will look into her claims, but first, Chloe and I still had unfinished business. There was one person we couldn't help notice wasn't at today's hearing. Someone Chloe and I had talked about the day before. Chloe's adoptive mother, Pat. You think Patricia will be there? I want to know. I mean, she did run off and get remarried instantly and say she didn't have anything to do with it. I hardly doubt she'd show her face. She honestly well, would give us an opportunity to speak with her as well and to be able to get her side. She wouldn't see. speak. I'm sure she wouldn't. But we had to try. So after initially failing to find her, we tracked down an address uh, that we think is a place where Patricia may live. Can I help you? Hi, are you Miss Patricia? Coming up. I'm not sure if you know today, Michael Hines was resentenced. How much did Chloe's adoptive mom know, and what does she think now? Chloe Christina Green is a liar. She's a liar? Yes, ma'am. And you are the one who stated you did not believe me. A confrontation nearly 10 years in the making. We're done. We're done. Thank we you. are done. What Michael Walter Hines did to his adopted daughter is unforgivable, betraying a 13-year-old's trust, sexually assaulting her, and even impregnating her. Now, nearly 10 years later, Chloe Howie says he's not the only one to blame for what happened to her. And with the help of Crime Watch Daily's Michelle Sagona, she's ready to do something about it. She was herself just a child when she gave birth to a rapist son. Turned into a mother by the legal guardian, she was forced to call dad. So 2004, Tyler was born. Mm -hmm. Where is Tyler now? Tyler resides with Belinda, my adopted mother. I knew that Belinda could have gave him tons of things I couldn't have given him. And, and the main thing is, is love, a motherly love. And, and I know it's not his fault. Today, Michael Hines is in prison for at least the next 10 years. But according to Chloe, he's not the only person who should answer for his actions. There is a picture in here of Patricia. Mm -hmm. She is handicapped. Right. And I feel like that's maybe why the state, you know, didn't come down on her when they should have. And so as far as Patricia's concerned, never stepped in to do anything, only made matters worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I believe she really absolutely knew about this the entire time. But with such powerful allegations leveled against her, we had to give Patricia a chance to respond. So after some deep research, we tracked her down to her address. I'm Michelle from Crime Watch Daily. Mm -hmm. And I, we're doing a story on a young girl named Chloe. who used to be her foster mom. Christine Green? Uh, Chloe? Chloe Christina Green, yes. Yeah, um, and so we were following her case. I'm not sure if you know today, Michael Hines was resentenced. No, I didn't. We were there for the sentencing. We were with Chloe in the courtroom. She read a very... Well, I sure wish I was there because um, I can tell you that Chloe Christina Green is a liar. She's a liar? Yes, ma'am. Why? What, why do you say that? Because she has a mental disorder. I was shocked. Pat seemed to be blaming the victim. So even though Chloe says that you did have an idea, you say today? Absolutely not. I have no idea. And if she were standing right here, I would tell her face to face. We decided to put that claim to the test. And surprisingly, after telling Chloe what Pat said, she agreed to meet with her. A few weeks later, we set up at an undisclosed location. And finally, after nearly 10 years apart, the two come face to face. How are you feeling right now? Do you have anything you want to say? I'm sorry that all of this happened to you and I wish that you felt like that you could have come to me and told me that this was happening. 
And with that, things immediately turned contentious. I did come to you. No, you didn't, Christina. You did not tell me. I did not know. Chloe. And Chloe, do you feel differently? I know differently. I was the child. I'm the one who spoke. And when I did, you were the one who stated you did not believe me. And Chloe brought documents, she says, to prove it. Everything you keep saying that I lied about, everything is here. Hold up. You're saying what you have there is statements that I made in court? Mm -hmm. There's a statement in here that states, and I, I want to know if you remember stating it, that I was inappropriate with your husband, that I tried to kiss him on his mouth all the time. Did yes, you say I that? I remember making that statement. You do? That you were being inappropriate. Mm -hmm. I was being inappropriate. Right. You really believe that? Yes. Pat now admits that was, quote, her mistake. But there are more explosive allegations to come, including that because she couldn't have children herself, Pat may have actually encouraged the birth of Chloe's child. Christina, Chloe, it wasn't something I wanted. Do you, you can I ask you one up. question? Why, if it wasn't something you wanted, why did you ask the nurse to give you pills to produce breast milk? It was documented, so please don't say that you didn't say it. Did you ask for pills did to you produce ask for pills? breast milk? I did not say that. Okay, what did you say? Because you did say something along those lines though, correct? It may not have been that, but it was something along the lines. We talked about this at the beginning. Nobody's walking away. We're going to finish. Cut. We're done. We're done. We're done. They we are done. Pat threatens to leave, but Chloe still has more to say. I honestly, listen to me though. Hear me out before you walk out of the room. Because this is serious, okay? And I would have never wasted my time to come down here today to face you and to say what I wanted to say if this wasn't important to me. I want to finish this. After a heated back and forth, the two sit back down to speak, and I want to give Pat a chance to answer another one of Chloe's claims. Pat, you ever hit her with your cane or with your walker? No. You had me cornered, and you were you were physically hitting me. Chloe, um, can we stop this back and forth? This discussion right now is not getting this, us anywhere. This is not um, achieving what I want to achieve right now. Tell this, me what it is you want to achieve. This. This, you're sitting there telling lies on me. Shortly after that, the two decide to go their separate ways. I wasn't able to ask Pat what she thought about the confrontation, though she continues to deny any prior knowledge of Chloe's abuse and still says she never abused the girl herself. She has never been charged with any wrongdoing. Either way, Chloe says she felt hurt. What's next for you? There's a lot that needs to be done. There's a lot of people that need to be held accountable. And more crimes Michael Hines may need to answer to. And an ironic twist, the same change in Kansas law that allowed for a reduction in Michael's sentence may also open the door for new charges. Crime Watch Daily now has new information on the status of Michael Hines. We've learned he's been moved from state prison to a local jail. And surprisingly, Hines now seems to have at least something to say from behind bars. In an email to Crime Watch Daily, Hines tells our producer in part, all I want now is to do the rest of my time, as I was incorrectly sentenced to begin with and would appreciate it if everyone would leave me alone. I am paying for my crime. As for Chloe, the kind of wounds she carries never really heal, but she hopes that by speaking up now, she can help save others. If you are at home watching this and you are going through this and you're scared, you know, turn to somebody. And if you don't have anybody to turn to, turn to me because I will listen. If you have to find me on Facebook, 10 years ago, I was just this kid that would cry my problems away. But now you're a woman who fights. Yeah.